nine of the apps, so yes. How many apps do you have in the app store, Jen? Mm, like 20. I'm taking them off because I can't maintain them. <laughs> she has a problem. I do have a problem. Also, iTunes has a problem, so one second, let me close it. Um, anyway, so we're thankful that you're here uh, and welcome. Um, I'll go ahead and get started. So let me just introduce my brother from another mother, TJ Van Toll, or as we say in Boston, he'd be my brother from another mother. <laughs> So I work as a developer advocate at Progress with Jen, and I'm actually going to let her start things off. You'll be hearing back from me here in okay. a minute. So we're going to go ahead, and um, I'm going to do about half of this talk, and then we're going to do a switcheroo, and TJ's going to come up, and we're going <laughs> to switch the computer. So it's going to be exciting, and you're in for a wild ride. Everybody ready? OK. <laughs> Woohoo! hoo Yay. Um, OK, so in case you don't know who we are, this is TJ, and I'm Jen, and um, we have our tweet. <laughs> we want to make sure that you tweet us up. We that you tweet up this uh, this talk very, very, very nicely. So we put our Twitter handles at the bottom of every single freaking slide. So you can't you can't miss us on Twitter. So here we are. So as I said, my name's Jen Looper, and I like to cook. Uh, I also like to make mobile apps, and we uh, do strange things on the stage of NGConf uh, on occasion. So we have some strange photographs. But here we are. So um, we are both developer advocates for NativeScript. And uh, in case you are not um, actively developing NativeScript, this, my part of the talk is going to be a little bit of an intro. Uh, and the talk right after us is going to be um, a little bit deeper dive into NativeScript plus Angular. So you are in the right room if you love these mobile apps as much as I do. So what is NativeScript? Well, NativeScript is an open source framework for building truly native mobile apps with JavaScript. Use your web skills like TypeScript, Angular, and CSS, and get native UI and performance on iOS and Android. Now, that's a big claim. Usually, when I have this slide up, I have another developer advocate from Ionic right in the front row harassing me. So <laughs> now we, this is a friendly audience. So this is a big claim, and I'm just going to unpack some of these words. This is a slide that we love to show, showing the adoption metrics. Uh, NPM downloads of the native script package. These are downloads per month. We love to see that lovely upward curve. Looking good to me. So native script is growing in popularity. And the other big claim is that native script is the best tool for cross-platform native app development. We love it. We hope you love it. And after this talk, we're sure you're going to love it. So I'm going to give you five reasons for why we think native script is, what, is a terrific tool to use. So the first reason is that it gives you a rich, animated, no compromise native UI with shared UI code. So because you're building mobile apps using JavaScript, TypeScript, Angular, Vue, you're, you're, you're using the runtime to, to create a native experience for yourself. And um, if you go to the app stores, iOS App Store or Google Play, download Examples Native Script. The name of the app is Examples Native Script. And you can, have a, you know, can, can feel how, how this app feels. It feels like a native app because it's a native app. So um, it's a great way to experience this kind of like buttery smooth animations and the beautiful layouts that we're able to offer. Um, the second point I wanted to make is about maximum code and skill reusability. So maybe you work in a, in a department or a shop or a, um, a, a group in your company that uses JavaScript. Well, you're in the right place because you can just go ahead and reuse the skills that you already have to build your native mobile apps. Uh, you can use CSS, uh, use NPM packages, use Angular 2 and up. What are we at? Five, six? Angular 5? <laughs> Here we are. Um, and you can use SAS if you like SAS. You can use um, all kinds of CSS compilers. Use Webpack. That's the Webpack logo. I always have to remind myself. Um, if you build an Angular app, you're definitely going to want to use Webpack uh, for, for making your apps um, start up a little bit quicker. If you uh, love TypeScript like I do, oh, iTunes, stop. Um, then you're uh, also in the right place because you can use TypeScript uh, or vanilla JavaScript as you like. If you're using Angular, you're definitely going to want to use TypeScript. And we have this new fabulous um, community integration for Vue.js, which I'm a big fan of. I, I really enjoy working with Vue. I'm going to show you a little demo in a little while. Um, and yes, I encourage you to take a look at what's going on in our community with Vue. Very exciting. We even have a logo. So that's the NativeScript Vue logo, and we're making stickers. So if nothing is legitimate until you have stickers, we're getting stickers made. So we're very excited about the sticker program. Um, but you have all these architecture choices that you, can, that you can use to build your NativeScript apps. You can use JavaScript, vanilla. You can use TypeScript by itself, TypeScript with Angular, 
or Vue. Right now we have, we have the availability of Vue with plain JavaScript, but we're working on the TypeScript story with that, um, with that integration. And then there is this ease of doing native -y things. Well, what kind of native -y things am I talking about? Well, for example, what if you want to go ahead and start manipulating files in your mobile app? Instead of writing a nice line of Java code you know, for your native Android app and another not so nice <laughs> Objective-C, a couple lines of Objective-C, you know, you have to, when you're writing na for native apps, normally you would you know, go ahead and write the same thing twice. You have to do it for Android, have to do it for iOS. Well, we've abstracted that away from you by the use of NativeScript modules. So here, we just import the file system module and then have um, a file instantiated. So it's a really um, great way to write natively without actually writing natively. You can also use NativeScript modules uh, in your XML on the front end. Normally on the front end in a NativeScript app, you're going to be using XML. And with the simple one, uh, just a few characters, not even one line of code, you can have a native switch uh, created for your app. So on Android, that's you know a native switch. And on iOS, a beautiful iOS switch. Now, if you find that you need special uh, extras, um, native uh, implementations in your app, maybe you need a, a fingerprint scanner or something, something extra special um, that your app might need, you're going to take a look at the native script marketplace, because these are all of the plugins that we've had created for us by the community or that we have created internally. I think there are over 650 NPM packages right now tagged at native script. So go to market.nativescript.org, search for what you need, and you'll most likely find it. If you can't find it, you're going to hit us up on Slack, and somebody might be able to make it for you, or you can make it yourself. Um, it's not too difficult to make a native script plugin. Not my favorite thing to do on a Sunday night, you know, when I want to relax, but plugin development is, is actually pretty straightforward with native script. And you can grab a package from Android Arsenal or a CocoaPod. I'm currently working um, to see if we can use the experimental TensorFlow CocoaPod for, um, for native script. So, you know, you can just sort of take a look and see. Uh, there's a lot of instructions online on how to do this. This is my favorite slide because it's the community slide. So the fourth reason why you might love NativeScript is because we have a vibrant and growing community. Love our community. They are absolutely fabulous. You can find them answering questions for you and also DevRel answering questions for you on our forums. So if you go to discourse or forum.nativescript.org, you can have kind of nice, calm, threaded uh, questions and answers. If you want a little bit of chaos in your life, open our Slack channel. Uh, where about uh, 4,700, 4,800 people are screaming at each other constantly. So this is, this is a fun thing to, to hop on. But if you have a quick uh, question, the Slack channel is a great way to get a quick response, if you're lucky. So. Um, and then the fifth reason is that we're supported by a major software company vested in your success, Progress. So um, employees, speaking to several other employees, but we are all in it together and supporting NativeScript for you. And then we have a couple bonus reasons why you might love NativeScript, and that has to do with some a new and fabulous tooling that we're offering. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a wonderful gift that we've had recently. We've had almost too much tooling to talk about. So um, today I'm going to give you a little demo of the Playground, NativeScript Playground, which is terrific for you know, spinning up a quick app and getting an idea of how, how you want to build something. And then once you're ready to start putting pedal to the metal, as we say, uh, when your CLI is um, installed and your, your, your SDKs are in place, then you can use NativeScript Sidekick, which is a great desktop application that gives you everything that you need to kind of take your app from zero to the App Store. You know, it helps you manage your plugins, your assets, all the good stuff that you're going to need to make your app extra special. So just um, to review, the five reasons I wanted to raise that you might, for, for which you might love NativeScript is the capability of building rich native UI, skills reuse, the ease of doing native type things with plugin development, great community, backed by progress, and then the bonus is this great tooling that we have available for you. So, I don't know if you realized it, but I went into business with TJ recently. We opened a fabulous shop. That's our storefront, and it is TJ and Jen's web, um, <laughs> sorry, web and mobile development shop, uh, old time shop. Uh, we also serve ice cream. <laughs> and we're so excited because we got our first big contract. <laughs> and it's a company that you might be slightly familiar with, Nididas. They have an affinity for native script. <laughs> so, yes, they love us. So they came to us and they said, Jen and TJ, we need a, a wonderful mobile app built for us. It needs to be cross-platform. It's a, it's, a, it's a shopping app, so you're going to take our inventory, 
bring it into the mobile app, and then I can go ahead and choose the beautiful things, and go add to cart, check out, and, and buy as much um, and as many items as I want. So hit the panic button. <laughs> um, actually, don't hit the panic button, because we've got you covered. NativeScript has us covered, thank goodness, with our tooling that we have available for us. And so they gave us the spec. This is the spec. Nice master detail, a nice card layout. You click on a card, you get your, your detail screen with the Add to Cart button, and then there's a little um, chart at the bottom with a little animation coming up for your reviews. So it's, uh, it's terrific. Um, I see a pattern with the Nididas type of clothing. It seems to be all blue, but um, it's awesome. They give us the contract, so we decided to go ahead and start building. All right, so I'm going to put this mic down. And playground. So, oh, okay. Here we are. So I'm going to, can you all hear me back there if I talk like this? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, I need my hands. <laughs> so uh, what we decided to do is to start in the playground and create a sort of a mock-up of what we're going to build. So this basic master detail screen with some dummy data, some hard-coded data, some dummy images. So I went to the, my favorite tool for making mockups, and that is the NativeScript Playground. And I'm going to just go ahead and paste in some code snippets to give you an idea because of what this code is going to look like. Because the, geez, Tara, because, <laughs> because the code base that I wanted to use for creating mockups is actually Vue. So you are in the privileged position of watching some of the very first um, conferences with NativeScript Vue integration. If you go to the Playground, you'll see it looks like this. They're going to give you a couple of um, uh, uh, scaffolds that you can choose from. You can go ahead and, and start with Angular, JavaScript, TypeScript, and then this experimental view integration. Now, because it's experimental, it's not using the actual plugin. It has everything imported here. And you can see in this native script view folder, we've got the chart directives hard coded in so that I can get some charting. Um, I actually imported the router as well because I need it for my master detail view. So I would start building by go ahead, and I've scaffolded out the, the initial view app. And I just start. Sorry. Um, by pasting in some, some the first page. So my first template is the products page. And it's a basic wrap layout. This is where the cards are coming in. So um, you notice I use the place bacon API to get some dummy pictures. So just to let you know, this um, is what uh, writing a NativeScript app looks like in view. Here's a native action bar, again, with the NativeScript modules. All you need is this one line of, line of code. And you can see um, a nice native script, a nice native um, action bar written for you. So this is a little bit not formatted so great, but this is the detail screen. And in the action bar, again, I, I give the product title. It's going to be delicious bacon. And then it's going to have these bits and pieces of images and labels marching down the screen in my stack layout. And then I have this Cartesian chart that's going to show the reviews coming through. And it's going to have some hard-coded data. So let me go ahead and um, start up the Playground app. So once I start saving my, my code, you're going to start seeing it in the Playground app. And it's, you don't have to have the device tethered. And you're not going to see anything right now, but it's going to start refreshing and refreshing as I go along. Um, so right now it's a white screen because I don't have my router implemented just yet. So if I could do this, here is the router. So now it knows where to start. And we should start seeing um, some wonderful bacon, which is coming from Place Bacon. It's like Place Kitten, but it's bacon. So um, this is the card layout that I used with a wrap layout um, marching down the screen, and then the name of the product and the price. If I would tap on this, I would get you know, the image of the product and then some, some sample just data that I grab. Place Bacon has both images and a, a text that's like bacon oriented. So, <laughs> And I have my Add to Cart button. And then the action bar, you notice, even with that one line, I can get this kind of native action bar drawn to the screen. Um, now, you notice it's missing a piece. It's missing the uh, charting information because I didn't give it any data. Here it is. So if I would save that, Playground's going to give me my beautiful chart. So this is the moment where everybody says, good job, Jen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, 
What I would do at this point, now that I've built the mock-up in view, I can either share it via this code, and uh, sometimes it's a little bit slow, but this will give a link to the current state of the playground, and you would just copy this and pass it over to a colleague, or uh, since I have a certain amount of CSS in, in here, you know, it's actually not that much, but uh, that's not so easy to, to, to share without sending some code along. So I can download the entire package and I get a zip and I would just email it to TJ. So there it comes and then I would just send it over. So um, that is the, what I wanted to show you with Playground, how far you can get with a view application with really not that much code to create mockups for yourselves. Thank you. Uh, so now TJ has the code and he's gonna come up and he's gonna take this, turn it into a nice production Angular app, ramp up, and he's gonna give it a wonderful backend built in Convey. So here we go. And while we're switching over, uh, I'll just pull this out here, pull this just over here, questions. and I will ask if you have any questions. Any questions that I can answer? companion apps and it's basically wrapping up what you're doing and sending it over wirelessly. So you download the companion apps from the app store and then your changes go live. So I don't have to have this tethered. Every time I make a change, it's gonna just come through my companion app. So um, it's really an amazing tool to, to share and you code. Any other questions? Cool, well, I'll let TJ take it over. All right, one second as I set this up. There we go, that's what I was looking for. All right, awesome. So I am TJ, I work with Jen, and I'm gonna take things from here. So Jen showed how to work in the NativeScript Playground. So the Playground is a browser-based environment that's great for tinkering, for learning how the NativeScript basics work. If you're first experimenting and wanna know how does CSS work in NativeScript, how do, CSS, or how do UI components work, how do grid layouts work, how does NativeScript interact with great framework, with frameworks, you can start experimenting with Playground. And the great thing about Playground is that it works in your browser. Right? You don't have to go through the process of setting up all the system dependencies needed to build completely native iOS or Android apps. So it's really great for tinkering. But of course, if you are building production apps, and again, this is what we're doing with Nadidas, we're getting this ready for the app stores at this point. At some point, you're gonna need to go through the processes of getting that sort of professional production environment in place. So what I wanna show is how to take that starting point that Jen got us rolling with, that sort of basic mockups, and turn it into an app that we're ready to push out, add some professional features to, and get this ready for the app stores. Now to do that, on the agenda for today, I'm gonna to cover three different things. The first, I'm gonna talk about some options that you have for NativeScript development. We're gonna look at both the NativeScript CLI as well as NativeScript Sidekick. From there, we're gonna look at how you can connect to backend data in your application, something almost all apps out there need to do. We're gonna look at a few different backends, but we're gonna primarily focus on how to get Kinvey working as an example of how you can tie your applications to live data and sort of a living backend. And finally, we're going to briefly look at working with plugins in NativeScript as well. Ultimately, what we hope you get out of all of this is just how to be successful building applications with NativeScript. And to do that, we're going to start as the first item of the agenda and some options that you have for NativeScript development. And the first of those is the NativeScript command line interface, or the NativeScript CLI. Now, when using the CLI, if I've got it open over here, I'll bump up the font size here. The NativeScript CLI is distributed through NPM, so it's something that you can NPM install, dash G NativeScript. If you do that, you'll have a command called TNS, which is short for Telerik NativeScript. And you can do things like TNS create, if you wanted to start up a new app from scratch. You can do TNS build to perform an iOS or an Android build on your device. Or you can run TNS run to just take that built asset and actually deploy it to either a USB connected iOS or Android device, or to something like an iOS simulator or an Android virtual device. Now the way the CLI works is it's actually performing those builds locally on your development machine. Now what that means is you have to have the system requirements because NativeScript is actually building truly native Android and iOS apps. You have to have those requirements on your machine in order to perform those builds from the CLI. So for Android, that's gonna mean having things like the Android SDK, having things like Gradle and Java installed. 
for iOS, it's going to mean you do need to have a Mac that has Xcode installed, because under the hoods, NativeScript is using Xcode to build applications for iOS. Now, we do have, if you go to the NativeScript documentation, there's full installation instructions on what you need to do after you NPM install the tool that'll walk you through these steps. There's an, even a few scripts that can help you get up and running pretty quickly. Now, the other option you have to perform NativeScript development is NativeScript Sidekick. Now, Sidekick, I've got that up over here, too. To turn the mirroring back off. Sidekick is really just a wrapper for the NativeScript CLI to sort of start off with. It does a lot of the tasks that the CLI does, but it provides a really nice UI to do so. But it also provides a number of additional features that we'll look at here in a minute that can really make you more productive when you're building NativeScript apps. So if you Google NativeScript Sidekick, um, you'll find an installer that will bring you to this screen that you see here. Sidekick is an, an app that's based off Electron, so it's cross-platform. It's available for Windows, for Macs, and for Linux devices. And the first thing you want to do when you see this screen is hit this Create button down here. Now, what you'll see here is a series of starter kits that you can use to start up your application. So most mobile apps follow one of many different uh, sort of patterns. Either you're using something like drawer navigation or tab navigation or something like master detail. Now, for the Nadidas app, we're going to start with this. We started with this master detail with Kinvey template that you see here. The other thing you can do in Sidekick is choose between different architectures. If you're more comfortable building with JavaScript, you can start from that point. You could also start with TypeScript or also Angular as well. This goes back to the architecture choices that Jen showed earlier, um, earlier in the talk. You'll notice there's no view options quite yet. It's not something that we have in there. You can, because Sidekick is just wrapping the CLI here, uh, you could always go to your command line and run TNS create to actually create your app. So if you did something like this, if you wanted to get started with view that way, you could absolutely do that. Uh, Sidekick, as the name sort of implies, is intended to be a sidekick both to the command line and also your text editor of choice. So you can absolutely go back and forth between the CLI and Sidekick based off what you're more comfortable with. If you have certain teammates that are more comfortable with the command line and others that are more com comfortable with a desktop tool like Sidekick, you can work side by side. There's no conflicts or no problems with doing so. So we're going to stick in Sidekick for the moment. Now you might have noticed that we already went and created this Nadidas app. So you're going to have to believe in our scenario here for our mobile development shop. Jen, of course, gave us these great mock-ups. We fast-forwarded a few days. You know, we've had the full team. We've been heads down on this, building this application up. We've been working in Sidekick. We've been working in the command line. And we've got this application now up here in Sidekick. Now, when I view this app in Sidekick, and I'm going to run it here in a minute, you'll see a couple things. Like, you can mess with some of the metadata of your apps. This is, again, when you're sort of tinkering in Playground, something that you don't necessarily need to consider, like some of the metadata, the permissions that your app might need when it's out on the App Store. But as you're getting ready for more you know, professional applications, something that you're ready to deploy, you will have to consider some of these things, like what permissions my app needs, what sort of metadata, what device types do I support, and such. You can also do assets. You want to get your app icons and splash screens in there. You can do some plugin management as well. We'll talk about plugins here a little bit later in the talk. But the real fun in Sidekick comes from this Run menu and these two options that live at the top of the screen. Now, this is Sidekick's build screen. And you can see that what's sort of interesting about here is that you can choose between local and cloud builds. Now, local builds is basically just going to delegate this build task down to the CLI. It's going to basically do the same exact thing the CLI does. It's going to build on your local machine. It's going to enforce that you have the system requirements in place to perform Android and iOS builds there. But if you switch to cloud builds in Sidekick, something, something else will happen. Instead, Sidekick will take your application code. It'll upload that code to Sidekick's build servers that live in the cloud and perform your application build there. Now, what's cool about that is it means that you don't have to have any of those things installed on your local machine, which enables a couple of really cool things. Probably the primary thing of those is that it means that you can build and develop iOS applications on either Windows or Linux devices, something that you can't do locally with the native script CLI. Now, for Nadidas, of course, this was an important consideration. They, they're a big shop. They have lots of people on different devices. They have some on Mac, some on Windows, some on Linux. So having Sidekick available means that Nadidas can have all of their developers work on the same application, regardless of what OS they're using to develop those apps on. So that's the build menu. There's one other menu here for run on device. 
All run on device does is take that same exact build, but also after that build is complete, actually push the build asset out onto various devices. You can see that Sidekick also detects any devices that are currently uh, sort of connected. This will connect like if I had a whole fleet of devices and I hooked them all up through USB, they would show up here. For the moment, I've got an iOS simulator and an Android virtual device here. So I'm going to perform a local build just because it'll be a little bit faster for the purposes of this demonstration and push this application so we can see what the Nadita's app looks like on device. Now, there is one thing I want to mention while this is running. So even though Sidekick does allow you to build iOS apps in the cloud, you still have to care about code signing those applications. So as a quick question, how many people here have built an iOS app at some point? So we've got about, all right, about 10 hands up in the room. Um, so for those of you that have, you might know, you probably remember, that iOS has a fairly, let's just say, non-trivial processes for code signing. I think that's putting it very kindly. Uh, I could use a much worse word. I wish for those of you that haven't done this before that I could sort of lie to you and tell you that this will be a simple process for you to learn. Um, it, there's a lot that goes into it, including creating signing certificates. Um, you have to create certificates and provisioning pro profiles for your applications. Now, this is something that is not unique to NativeScript in any way. This is something that if you intend to develop iOS apps, regardless of platform, regardless of technology, is something that you're going to have to learn and go through. Now, I could give an entire talk that just walks through this. We could spend an entire hour on this. The best thing I'll do is I'll point you at the documentation we have for Sidekick. So if you go to docs.nativescript.org, which is the NativeScript ho uh, documentation home, there's a Sidekick tab here on the side. And there's a whole, <laughs> you can see how much documentation is required just to walk through code signing for iOS. But if you're wondering sort of how we make it possible for you to build iOS apps on Windows at all, uh, you do have to upload that certificate and provisioning profile to us because we're going to need those files in order to create that build. And in Sidekick, there is, if you go to build, if you're on Windows and you go to build, it's going to prompt you for those certificates and for those provisioning profiles before you're able to build your app. So with that in mind, let's see if our build's finished. So I'm going to bring up my simulator. Got to love the notch on that iPhone 10 bring up my Android virtual device as well. I'll do a little bit of resizing here. So this is what the Nadidas app looks like. You can see that we've polished the UI up. Uh, we switched the bacon out with actual images that are coming from the Nadidas product store here. And we've added a few new features. So if I poke around, you can see the, the chart that we saw earlier. Uh, we've added a little side drawer in here for a little bit of navigation. And there's also some cart functionality as well. Now, the next step, sort of now that you have your applications running, right? you figured out how to get apps out on devices, whether they are simulators or they're actual physical devices that you have connected, is you're going to want to make changes to your app. You're going to want to develop. So if I open this app up in my editor of choice, Visual Studio Code, and NativeScript doesn't care what editor you use, Sidekick or the CLI doesn't either. Suppose I want to make a change to this application. Let's just say that uh, you know I'm going through this, oops, and I, I see this chart that's on the side of the screen here, and I decide that I want to switch these bars from being horizontal to being, or from being vertical to being horizontal. Now I, I just happen to know that I can do that by switching these two directives, two attributes here in my markup. Don't worry about the specific code change. The API is not really important. What I do want to show is just how fast Sidekick and the NativeScript CLI are both able to push those changes out. Again, remember, what's cool here, these are truly native Android and iOS applications, right? These are completely native UI components. This is something that you would normally have to build in something like Android and X, uh, Android Studio and Xcode. And you can see with NativeScript, what you get is a really, really fast development cycle. Uh, because your code is markup, JavaScript, and CSS, these, once, even though the initial builds, you, the initial builds took like a full minute, which is going to be the same with native applications, but your development cycle is really fast. There's a really fast iteration loop of, between how fast you make your changes and actually see them on your device. And you can see the bars on the charts have now changed. So now that we've made that change, let's head back to Sidekick because there's one additional thing I want to show. So this is my fairly typical uh, development cycle with NativeScript. I typically have an Android 
one Android virtual device up, one iOS simulator up. That's how I develop most of my applications. Um, if I was getting this app actually ready for the App Store, like if I was ready to really you know, battle test this app, I might hook up you know, at our development shop. We've got a full device farm, right? Like I might get out a few iPads. I might get out a few different Android vice devices with different versions. Um, we've had you know, 10, 12 devices with some you know, fancy USB hubs for testing multiple apps at the same time on a number of device form factors, and it's something that you might want to do. But for typical, you know, just I'm commonly developing some feature, usually I find uh, having one of each simulator up to be fairly sufficient. So the next thing, so this is sort of, you've deployed the apps, um, and then after that, you've, you've started developing on it, you keep making changes to these applications. One thing you'll probably want to do is also debug your applications, because at some point, some sort of problem will come up. And in Sidekick, what I can do is, in this Devices menu, this pane at the bottom of this, the screen, there's this option for launching the Chrome Developer Tools. And what this does is, with NativeScript, we've integrated with the Chrome Developer Tools to allow you to use the same basic tooling, this gets back into the skills reuse Jen talked about earlier, that you would use for web applications, but use them in mobile apps as well. And so one thing I can do, and the, I'll zoom in here in a second, because I know this is kind of small, so you can see on this Elements tab, for example, a full visual tree of your application, of the actual UI components we're using to develop this app. You can even change these things. So if I, oh, I actually don't think that'll work. I'll just type in some nonsense here. If I change some attributes, that change will be reflected live on the device. So you can see it pushed out that change here. Again, remember, this is a native Android app, too. This is not like a styled div here that we're working with, which I think is pretty cool. You can also do things like view console logs. Uh, you can set JavaScript breakpoints, too. You have a full JavaScript debugger in here. Uh, again, don't worry about the details. I know the font is kind of small. But for example, uh, on menu tap here, I know this function happens to get called. So I can set breakpoints if I am dealing with, and this is TypeScript to code, too. So we've got source maps worked out, too. So I can just step debug through my TypeScript code if I run into some problems, if there's something I want to tweak. You've got all the normal things you'd expect a JavaScript debugger to have. You can set watch variables. You've got a call stack. You can see things in scope. You can set breakpoints. You can deal with all of these types of things. I'll just step through this right now. Uh, you can view network requests as well. So this, is, again, works kind of like this does on the web. Um, the, as you make network requests, if you want to debug how things work with your backend, those would show up there. So that's what the DDDS app looks like right now. And that hopefully gives you a sense of what the full NativeScript development cycle looks like. You know, with the starter templates, you can start from a pretty common starting point to push out your application. With Sidekick, you can develop, you can build and push those apps out to devices and use things like Live Sync and the debugging tools to actually go through the development cycle. So with that in mind, the next thing I want to talk about, the next thing on our agenda, so we covered options for native script development. The next thing is connecting to backends, because at some point, almost all mobile applications are going to need access to some data of some sort. Now, the great thing about NativeScript is that you have a lot of options for connecting to backends. NativeScript is really just a platform that enables you to use really any number of things. The first is probably what drives a whole lot of mobile apps is just some sort of RESTful or HTTP-based APIs. So in NativeScript, there is an HTTP module that lets you do all the normal calls you'd expect to do. You need to do you know, gets, puts, pull, uh, pushes, those sorts of things. Um, they're easily, uh, you're easily able to do that using the HTTP module in NativeScript. We also directly integrate with Angular's HTTP service. If you are using Angular in your native script app, so that you could just use that service verbatim as you would in a Angular web app. So that's what a lot of people will use. Um, if you have like an internal API or you need to use some sort of third party service that has an HTTP API, it's really trivial to do in native script. You can also use mobile specific tools, things like SQL Lite, if you're interested in that sort of thing. There's a plugin out there available. And there's also plugins available for a lot of other services that you might be using. So if you are using Firebase or Couchbase or Azure or Kinvey or any number of other providers that are already out there, the plugins just essentially lower the, the barrier for you to getting started, essentially provide some convenience functions to make it really easy for you to connect and manage your data in your applications. So this is a talk on NativeScript and Kinvey. So for this example, we're going to look at how we can use Kinvey to tie into the back end of this mobile application. Now, Kinvey, uh, I actually uh, reached out to the Kinvey team because I said, well, can you give me a slide that sort of briefly introdu introduces what Kinvey does? And this is the slide that I got back, which I think we can all agree is very simple, very easy to understand. I, I'll give you about 10 more seconds to look this over, and I think we'll be good. 
But the point I want to make here is that Kimbe does it a lot, right? And we've got, what, like 20, 20 some minutes left here today. So we're not going to comprehensively cover everything Kimbe can do. What I'm going to specifically focus on today is the part at the bottom there. Uh, one thing Kinvey does really well is let you tie into existing data, existing sort of data stores. So if you have data that lives in places like SAP or uh, I don't know, Salesforce, uh, those sorts of places, Kinvey makes it really easy to connect to those places. The second I'll show is that flex service bit that lives right above that. Uh, there are essentially little scripts that you can use to manipulate data as it goes to and from your app. So I'll show a little bit of that in action. And specifically, you know, for our development shop, Nadidas gave us three requirements of their backend. There were three things that they absolutely needed for their mobile app. The first is that they wanted to connect to an existing product catalog. So as a lot of companies out there, their product data is already in some database. Um, they're not going to change that sort of thing. We have to be able to tie into that system as part of this mobile app. The second is they want their shopping cart experience to work offline. So I showed how we added a shopping cart to the user interface. We have to make sure that that continues to work in an offline environment. And finally, we want to give the users a personalized experience. So that first screen of the app that shows a feed of products, we want it, the Nadidas team wants the ability to sort of tweak that uh, to meet certain needs at certain times of the year. So we're going to look at how you can do those sorts of things. And so I will switch back to my demo here, and we'll continue things going. I'm going to switch to my browser to show Kinvey here. Now, if you go to kinvey.com, if you sign up for a free trial, you're going to see a screen that looks pretty much like this. And it'll give you a brief overview of sort of the things you can expect Kinvey to do. So Kinvey is a backend as a service. So your data comes into this section here where you set up collections. Um, you can also store files as well. You can do user management. You can set up roles and permissions as well. You can do things like push and analytics and a few other things that we're not exactly going to go over in too much detail. What I want to start is with this collections bit, because this is where the actual data for this application resides. And I set up this product collection here, and it's going to have the data that you already saw here, oops, not there, <laughs> at this part of the mobile app here. So this data corresponds to what shows up here. Now, if you remember, our first requirement was that we wanted to tie into some existing data. We didn't necessarily want to rely on some hard-coded data in a Kinvey backend. So one thing Kinvey lets you do is if I go into the settings of this data type, you can easily switch between using Kinvey data stores versus using an external data service. And what I did, I sort of pre-planned this uh, Nadita's S SVDC, which is essentially a connection to a Salesforce database. So in here, I've got some Salesforce credentials set up, sort of like the username and password that Kinvey is going to need to actually connect to this Salesforce instance. And once I have that set up, the change is quite literally as easy as flipping a switch. So if I say I want to get product data from Salesforce instead, all I have to do is confirm that change. And then if I go back to my application and just refresh here, what you should see is that the data is switching over from that hard-coded data that was in Kinvey over to the Salesforce instance, which has a bunch of soccer balls in this case, or footballs. I forgot. I'm in Europe at the moment. I can also easily switch back. So if I wanted to go back to the Kinvey data store, I'm just going to flip back for the rest of this demo. I think I messed up that poll. There we go. Get this data back in here as well. What's cool, though, is you'll notice in order to provide that change, I didn't actually have to go into my source code and change anything up. This is really great if you want to decouple your front-end development from your back-end development, because my front-end development code didn't, you know, again, I didn't have to change anything. Um, so if you wanted to, say, configure your back-end to have multiple environments, maybe you have like a test, a staging, a production environment, uh, maybe you want to be able to switch between multiple providers without having to necessarily change your front-end code, Convey is really good at enabling that sort of scenario. So that was our first requirement, the being able to switch over to existing product data. That's what we just showed right here. The second was about making the shopping cart work offline. And to show that one, I'm going to start by uh, digging, digging into the code a little bit that actually drives all of this. So this is the service that actually works with the shopping cart in this native script application. And don't worry too much about the details here. This is, this is a lot of this is Angular code. As Jen mentioned earlier, the, there is a talk on NativeScript and Angular directly after this one, where they'll go into a lot more detail in some of the syntax that you see here. All I want you to concentrate on at the moment is this line of code here. Uh, this is getting the Kinvey namespace out of the Kinvey NativeScript SDK, which just happens to be the name of the Kinvey plugin. And once you have that data store, 
uh, once you have that reference to Kinvey, really all you need to do to set up to work with your collections is instantiate one of these collections, which is what this line of code does here to set up this cart store. This name, Shopping Cart, if I go back to the Kinvey backend, corresponds, I keep missing what I'm typing, to this shopping cart collection that you see in the back end here that currently just has this one shopping cart instance. And once you have it, uh, a reference to this cart store, all you have to do is call one of many different methods on it. This example primarily uses find because all the app really does is just load the shopping cart from the back end. Um, there are also methods to do things that you might expect to do with a data type, like update it, like add new instances, um, delete, all those sorts of usual operations are available as well. This one's just using find. There is a little bit of unique code in here that's in this constructor, though, that's specific to this example. So what we're doing here is we're using one of the NativeScript core modules. Jen talked a little bit about these earlier. And in this case, I'm using the connectivity module that's built into NativeScript. So NativeScript provides a lot of these sort of convenience things for common things that you might need to do in your applications. Now, in this case, what we're going to do is use the start monitoring method from that connectivity module and say, Start monitoring the user's network activity, basically how good is their connection. And whenever it changes, NativeScript will call this callback function that you see here. Essentially, there's been a change in connectivity. And what this block of code is saying is if the new connection is not none, so basically if they've gained a connection to the network, then call the sync method on the data store. So essentially, when the user comes back online, sync any changes that have occurred locally up to the back end. Now, what this looks like in action is, so I'm in the application, right? I'm a user. I've downloaded the Adidas app. I'm liking what I see, right? There's some pretty good stuff up on that list there. But what do you know? Uh, I'm looking at these things, and my, my train just happens to go into a tunnel, right? It's really bad timing. But right at that moment, I decide, you know, this pretentious looking jacket here is really right for me. This is something I really want. So I'm going to go here and add this into my cart. And I'm going to go into this hoodie here and add this to the cart as well. So if I look at the shopping cart here, I've got two items. But of course, if I go to the back end and actually refresh this, um, this product's data is empty, which of course makes sense. This device is offline. It has no way of telling the back end that the user has added these items. But if I go back online here, I get out of airplane mode. Because of this block of code in my shopping cart service that's going to detect, all right, I went back offline, so I'm going to need to call sync. If I go back to my Kinvey backend and refresh, the products now appear there. Because Kinvey knows on that sync call that changes have been made locally, and I need to push those changes up to the backend. So again, this is pretty seamless, right? This is what NativeScript and Kinvey enables you to do. So NativeScript gives you the little chunks of functionality that you need for these common tasks, like working with the network. And Kinvey makes it really easy to sync these things up, to work in an offline, online scenario, which is pretty common in mobile applications. So if we think back to our three requirements, the first was tying into existing product data. The second was this whole offline experience, which we've now covered as well. The third was in customizing the user's feed, or really customizing this screen that you see here, when, that the user sees when they load up their app. Now, to do this, I'm going to implement something that Kinvey calls Flex Services, which is just that, if you remember back to the chart, it's the, the little thing that happens, uh, the path you go through as you go to and from your native script, uh, well, your Kinvey back end. I think it's easier to actually show in code, because I've got a little script right here. This is an actual Kinvey uh, flex service here. I actually like to think of these things kind of like NPM hooks. So right, NPM hooks are for things like uh, after install, before install, that you can run some functionality. With Kinvey, it's operating on data sort of as it comes and goes from your application. So again, the specifics of the API aren't too important here. I'm just trying to go into the problem that I'm solving here. In this case, this is going to happen as the user loads products. So I have the products here. And that's basically the products that, after the back end has ran, it's going to find those products in the back end, ship them up to the application. And what the service is going to say is, OK, you've got these products. Well, let me do a little work here. First, I'm going to say, who's the current user? Who is the person that actually requested and wanted these products? And what this block here is going to say is, sort those products based off the user's preference. Essentially, put the things that the user prefers at the top of the list potentially because that is something they might be more likely to buy within the application. Now, this is obviously pretty simplistic, but I will we'll expand on that in a moment. 
So what I'm going to do is we'll load this app up on iOS. We've implemented a, a little hook at the moment just to show this off in action. Currently, I am logged into this application, and my preference is for menswear, which is why you see menswear at the top of the screen. But we do have another user that we can switch between. We can switch over to Jen's user type. And Jen is more of a fan of women's wear. That appears at the top of the screen as well. Now, again, obviously, this is quite simplistic, right? Like, this isn't code you necessarily might push to production. But think of the potential that you have here. You know, imagine that the user has logged in with their Facebook account and you know their likes. Perhaps you could put items that they've shown interest in or likes or previous purchases towards the top because they might be more interested in buying those sorts of things. Or maybe you have sales, right? The first of the month hits and you want to put certain sale items towards the top of the screen. What's cool, again, is that I'm developing this script outside of the application code. So I don't have to go through a full iOS or Android app cycle, you know, push these things up to the App Store in order to see these changes. This is something that you could just fire up into the Kinvey backend uh, and sort of test things on the fly. So those are our requirements. If we, we go back here, we've now successfully connected to that existing product catalog. We've now made that shopping cart experience work offline. And we've now given the users a personalized experience. So on our agenda, we've now covered options for native script development. We've now connected the backends. So the last thing we want to do is add a little bit more polish before we're ready for the stores here and talk about working with plugins. So in NativeScript, as Jen mentioned earlier, the place to go when you want to get started with plugins in NativeScript app is, is the NativeScript marketplace, which is at market.nativescript.org. Now, here you'll find plugins for a lot of the things we've already talked about today. Like if you're using one of these existing services to connect to a backend, you'll find Kinvey here, Firebase. But you'll also find a lot of other powerful things that you might want to add to your mobile applications. For example, maybe you want fingerprint authentication. You want to add that to your application. There's a plugin for that to enable that sort of scenario. Uh, maybe you want to add different social sharing, uh, like you want the users to be able to share content via social media. Or maybe you want them to log in via Facebook. That's also a plugin that's available. For the purposes of this talk, uh, I'm just going to show a single plugin, and one of my favorite ones because it's kind of cool, and that is the NativeScript AR plugin, AR being augmented reality. Now, iOS has recently released these APIs for ARKit, which is uh, the, and it's shipped in iOS 11. And with NativeScript, because we're able to access the latest and greatest device features, this is absolutely something you can consume in your NativeScript apps. So that is what I want to show. And you'll have to give me a second here, because I'm going to need one problem with working with the iOS simulator. Uh, I guess to test augmented reality, you must have a physical device. Uh, because on the simulator, you don't have a, a camera to sort of point around at things. So what I'm going to do is connect my iPhone, which I just happen to have the Nadidas app already wired up. And I'm going to show you how people are making use of this AR app. So QuickTime does a pretty good job of mirroring screens. So I'm going to open up QuickTime, new movie recording. You're going to see my face here for a second, I think. Let's see if it's, yep, there's my face. And then we'll switch over to the iPhone. And oh, no, this could not be completed. Try again. This is like the tech debugging 101. If it does not work, try again. Oh, yeah, choose iPhone. Oh, I did do iPhone. Switch it back and forth. If this doesn't work, we'll take uh, questions for a minute. Get to see my face again. We'll give this a second. Otherwise, we can abandon this and, and try something else. Uh, Jen, you want to come up and see if there's any questions while I try to debug and figure out what's up with this? Yeah, OK, so this is working. So I, I will come back to your question in just a minute. So interestingly enough, I didn't do anything different. I just tried it a third time, and it happened to work. So 
Go technology. But what I want to show is I've got the, the Adidas app here. Again, this is the exact same app we, we saw before, but we've added one new feature. So if I go to look at this cube here, you can see that there's this new preview and reality button. So what Adidas is trying to do here is, you know, they've got this product catalog and they want to give their users the ability to actually see those items in the real world. You can see this being kind of cool for things like the soccer balls or even, even maybe shirts if you wanted to project a shirt onto someone to see what that sort of thing looked like. So the way this works is, uh, essentially, I see my camera, and sometimes my VR mode has to detect a plane, which is just a, sort of a flat surface that you can put models on. And if you see the blue, the yellow dots, it's sort of in debugging mode where it's trying to detect this plane. It really likes my backpack. I can usually get it to reliably work there, which is why I threw that down. Uh, yep, there it goes. So then once it's got the plane, this is again something you configure. For debugging mode, I just made this really transparent just so it's really easy for everyone to see. You can sort of drop models onto that. So I chose the stress cube just because it's a really easy thing to demo and make a model for and drop things off on the screen for. Uh, it gets more complex when you get into more advanced things, like you have to be able to create 3D models. Uh, if you look for the NativeScript plugins app out on the iOS App Store, um, there's actually a demo that's more feature complete with this. So if you have an iPhone, you can test with this yourself. Uh, there's a lot more in-depth models in for this. But you can, again, see the potential. And actually, like, I could spend a lot of time playing with this. Actually, my, my favorite thing is when they drop off the edge, because for some reason, that's very satisfying to me. Uh, another fun thing to do is, it's not practical at all, but just to see how high you can build this structure. So kind of fun, and also, like I said, potentially pragmatic as well. This is something that is not only a toy, but could be seriously used. For example, the IKEA uh, recently released an app that lets you do this exact same sort of thing. Uh, you can basically view furniture items and just toss them in your room in augmented reality using these exact same APIs you see with NativeScript. And really, just to sort of wrap things up, this is really the power of NativeScript sort of from start to finish. So NativeScript lets you do the sort of common things that you need to do to build a mobile app. So starting from templates, having some build tools available, lets you debug, lets you code, those sorts of things. The things that you'd expect to be able to do from a mobile app. But NativeScript also lets you tie into sort of the latest and greatest, the, the newest things that are out for Android and iOS. And between it, you can really build some really powerful, some really cool things. And so with that in mind, I'm going to give a few last notes here, and then we'll move uh, on to take a some questions. So if you found any of this interesting, if you want to keep up with NativeScript, the sort of two best places moving forward, uh, you can sign up for the NativeScript newsletter. You can use that URL or just Google NativeScript newsletter. The newsletter goes out about every month and sort of has the highlights of what we've been doing in the NativeScript world. So it's a great place to follow along. If you're the sort of person that likes daily updates, you really want to stay on the cutting edge, we're pretty active on Twitter, so you can follow the NativeScript Twitter account for updates. If you want to learn NativeScript in more detail than we had time for today, uh, if you head to nativescript.org and click the big green Getting Started button, uh, you'll, there's a handful of tutorials that you can go through for, again, learning NativeScript really in depth. I'll again mention that there's a NativeScript Angular talk right after this in this room, which will also help you get started with NativeScript, specifically when using Angular. Uh, and so with that, that's basically it. I am going to then transition right to your question here about IntelliSense. And <laughs> so uh, first of all, with NativeScript, because uh, we support TypeScript, I should show that like, when you're developing locally, uh, so for example, if I'm using like this connectivity module, um, you get the sort of TypeScript IntelliSense that you'd sort of expect to have. Uh, like, let's see, what's some other NativeScript API I can work with? Like product dash uh, list at components. So, you know, if I'm working with, oh, I don't know, uh, some random NativeScript API, you'd have the, the sort of, we have full TypeScript support for really everything we do in NativeScript. And with the playground specifically, um, if I'm working in, we'll, we'll just pick Angular. And I don't remember, we're using some uh, reusable library for the actual editor part of this, and that's what provides the TypeScript support. I wish I could remember the name of it. Mono, what is it? Yeah, but um, so you do have this, this sort of TypeScript autocomplete because it's built into that editor. Oh, and the XML as well. Oh, yeah, that's kind of handy. 
Any other questions about really anything at this point? Native script, convey, no questions. We totally nailed it. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, so the question was about Kinvey and about basically pricing. Uh, and really, Kinvey has a free trial plan for you to start things out. I don't know the specifics of the, the pricing plans with Kinvey, so I'd have to refer you to Kinvey's pricing pages for more details, unfortunately. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can you use the free uh, profiles from Apple? And the answer is yes. Yep. And I, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, Jen, you would know this, but the free program uh, lets you develop iOS apps, and then you need to update to the paid plan if you actually want to push those apps out to the store. So if you're just looking to like tinker, you know, getting started with your apps, like absolutely start on the free plan. You know, use that to sort of test the waters. Any other questions? All right, well, if you have anything else, Jen and I will be around for the rest of this event. There's a little survey link here if you want to tell us how we did. And with that, thank you. <laughs>